been the CEO at Hypercity and has been heading uh, certain uh, parts of businesses at Airtel. Welcome, Ramesh. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Abhinav. Good to meet you. Cool. Thanks a lot, Ramesh. So I, I must say that Ramesh is one of those people who I, I personally reach out to almost every time when, when there's some uncertainty in my mind. And I think I'm really surprised by the kind of uh, inputs he does, he gives every single conversation. You'll, you'll definitely get to learn something new, which I think is a sheer magic of his experience and in the different kind of industries he has he's been a part of. So I just wanted to kind of make sure that all of you get that similar sense and get, I mean, the real vigor that that Ramesh has. One of the finest leaders by by far I have met in my life. Really happy to be uh, knowing you so closely, Ramesh. And and thanks a lot for taking time for talking to us today. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. We'll we'll get started right away, Ramesh. So. Uh, uh, the idea here is, I mean, we'll break the session into two things largely. One is I, I would love to understand from your experience and your interpretation of, of the situation. I have a couple of questions on that. And then uh, the other part would be like a quick rapid fire that I'll invoke sometime uh, in between. Yep. So let, let's get started right away. Uh, the first thing we would love to know from you, I think COVID uh, is probably the biggest uh, 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 like talk of the town right now. We'd love to understand from you, what are your, what are your key learnings? How do you think uh, your life has particularly changed and how would you kind of, I mean, some takeaways that you would continue with you in the life ahead. Yeah, I think it's uh, changed quite dramatically, actually. Uh, what has taught us is really that uh, the future is unpredictable. So make the most of the present and be prepared for the future. Right. And, uh, you know, more than anything else, it's the need to be, uh, need to be resilient and more than, more, even more than that, the importance of, uh, you know, unlearning and new learning. That's really what I see a lot of people doing now. And I'm, I'm glad that people are doing that. And uh, if, if they can actually keep up with that and, and continue being agile, continue being resilient and continue being uh, learners, then I think the success is, uh, is theirs. But if you're resisting that, then there would be a problem. The, and, and the other big learning that I've had during, uh, during this, and, and I've observed it uh, with others as well, the more autonomy you give people, the harder they work, and the more they come, more committed they are. So we haven't been peeping over the shoulders of our, you know, employees and teams, and uh, you know, micromanaging them, and they've been working much harder and better than they've ever done before. So there is a truth in that which I think managers should 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 uh, sort of uh, see and implement when they get back to work. You know. Make sure that you're you're not sort of micromanaging the teams and you're giving them autonomy and freedom so that they are they are committed and they have the entrepreneurial spirit alive in them. Absolutely, but but what's the difference? Like I mean, in the two words, right, where you get to interact with folks and your peers every day versus the new world where you I mean only can digitally talk to them, right? What are the key things that you can do to kind of get as close to that real experience as possible? I think uh, more or less, uh, you know. We have to get used to this now, at least uh, for the next six, seven months, this is going to be reality. I guess at, at some point in time, it'll be maybe one week in office, one, one day in office, uh, you know, four days uh, at home, or maybe you come in for meetings and then go back home and get, get your work done. And that's the way I think the future is likely to be. And, and that's an interesting way for the future to be because there are companies across the world that already do that. I mean, not the ones who, when they're like, you know, uh, like the Googles and the, you know, the Twitters of the world. But there are others, I think, uh, who have been practicing it for some time where you know, people meet, uh, engage when they meet, and then after that, go out and, and do their own stuff. And that's, that's really the way I think uh, the future is. And I thought, to me, that's a more productive way of working because you know, you're cutting out the time of transportation, you know, the commute, uh, the stress, the hassle, uh, all of that. You are, your work-life balance is is at least theoretically much better. And uh, everybody uh, you know, works that much harder because then you take ownership for what you're doing. You're not depending yeah. on a boss to tell you what to do or what not to do. And you're, you're on your own. So autonomy plus connectedness, I think will be the, the magic mantra. If you can you know, make sure that there's connectedness along with autonomy, then there will, there will be success. And if you're a leader practicing management that way, I think you'll get success. Absolutely. And and what about things like reviews? And like, I mean, as a part of leadership team, right, you would have been grooming uh, like younger leaders, you would have been giving critical feedback to teams. How how different is that now? I mean, can you really express yourself with that level of, I mean, clarity on, on a video call? The only thing that's missing on a video call is passion and energy. 
other yeah. than that, the number of reviews have really increased you know <laughs> in, in the absence of anything else everybody seems to have got into a review mode one thing that's done for me that is done for me at least is that you know i find myself almost organized today and i i used to pride myself of not being you know to the t in terms of my entire calendars booked and so on yeah find my calendars booked by somebody else without even me knowing and, and you're sort of you know managing that calendar so yes life has got a little more organized i wish i could bring more passion onto the screen that's difficult to do so i think we the via media of doing one day in office and uh, five four days you know uh, at home it will be a good uh, you know midway that can help the organization and help the individual as well absolutely okay uh, moving on to the next thing uh, ramesh from your experience in your network right you you worked in telecom retail media and many other markets right what basis your understanding is is the effect of covid on on these different industries businesses i mean how do how do you see them today and what what's your expectation maybe for the next 6 to 12 months for all, all of them i think all businesses barring a lucky few have been impacted by that uh, fundamentally every business is de- dependent on consumer demand yeah and consumers incomes are uh, you know falling then uh, demand is likely to fall and therefore all businesses are affected but i think the road to recovery is uh, slow it will be slow and it will be painful there are many more months of this, this recovery it, you know it, it wasn't as if we were in a very great shape before the covid thing happened you know, even then there were signs of recession and so on yeah it will take some some time uh, to to recover maybe a year, year or two but uh, i think there are at least a good thing is there are some green, green shoots visible right now you know and every week is better than the preceding week so as long as we keep up that pro, that that uh, growth and uh, we're able to get people back into jobs and we get be able to get the large majority of the the, the country which is the source of all demand uh, working again i think we should be back on our feet but i think it will take 3 uh, to 6 months hopefully diwali will be a you know a, a, a you know sort of shot for it and you can you can sort of help get the demand back into you know. right absolutely uh, but but more connected on on that do you see uh, industries like telecom and and say grocery particularly getting any benefit out, out of this whole thing or do you think demand is equally affected there as well ultimately it all depends on you know consumer demand and demand. demand is low because consumers don't have enough income or don't have enough money mm. uh you will never get the kind of growth that they got before uh grocery uh, people will slowly but surely come back to just buying what is essential the discretionary purchases have stopped and as long as discretionary purchases are not there uh i don't know how you know overall growth can come back right uh, you know the regular stuff is always going to be bought but but the fact that you know all growth is dependent on on that discretionary spend that people do right including uh, for telecom you know the amount of spend on data and so on would have come down in rural areas because rural incomes have gone down you know migrants have gone, gone back home you know they won't be spending as much of their uh, money or hard earned savings now you know on uh, buying data packs so i think there's an overall s- slow down and it will take some time until income comes back into people's pockets Uh, it's unlikely that demand will come back yes regular stuff grocery will have less of a degrowth than other uh, you know luxury uh, goods but uh, it's still going to be lower than last year right right and any particular thought, thoughts on e-commerce where do you think i mean e-commerce today in india is still like very small just like a 30 35 billion dollar industry out of which grocery is hardly like 1 1.2 billion dollars how do you see that shaping for for the next 3 years and your bet on on that if at all you take on the biggest beneficiary of this and, and you know if uh, there was a black swan event that would uh, you know impact a particular industry this was it for them and uh, this should have actually helped e-commerce get to the next orbit right almost like a you know a shot that will take it into a, a, a different orbit altogether but the fundamental change i think will be that there will be no separation or or the way that i would see it Uh, and the way retailers should operate is that there should be no separation between e-commerce and you know other uh, modes of retail i mean it should, e-commerce should should stop being a word in this uh, in retail dictionaries actually no every retail will and should become an e-commerce player so called e-commerce player and most e-commerce pe- players will 
anyway be physical players and you're yeah. seeing all over the world you have seen it even before and i think it's time to stop talking about e-commerce there will be various ways of modes of methods of delivery or you know uh, accessing the products that you you buy you know you could be buying in store you could be buying uh, on your uh, mobile or on your laptop and then picking up in store or you could be you know taking home delivery but you know those lines will have to merge and the borders between the two e-commerce and retail on traditional retail or physical retail should actually you know slowly get obfuscated and the retailers who don't recognize that this wall is falling and this the, the barriers need to be broken i think will become less and less uh, relevant in the future no if you for, for one if you remove the word e-commerce from our dictionary i think a lot of change can happen one has to just look at the way consumers are behaving and e-commerce is a very industry uh, language i think let's look at the way consumers are behaving consumers are seamlessly transiting between uh, buying it on a mobile and buying it physically right you know yeah. some it's convenient i buy it from my mobile on on the internet and when it's convenient i go to the store and when it's convenient i you know ask them to keep it there and i go and pick it up so if consumers are behaving like that retailers need to behave that way as well because that's that's really the way uh, one needs to uh, i you know sort of a picture our uh, future business the way the consumer does it not the way we would like to sort of talk. so i think that demarcation demarcation between uh, physical commerce and e-commerce will start diminishing and it's only uh, it's going to be more about consumer convenience uh, and consumers will continue to alternate between the two whatever they're buying it could be a book it could be you know uh, cosmetics it could be grocery it could be food it could be any of this but you know consumers will keep you know moving between between uh, various forms and restaurants are the the best example they've always been sit in dine in or take away or home delivery i mean why would retail not be that way that's really the question that retailers need to ask themselves why would i not be you know so called e-commerce player as well right right but but what about the economics i mean doesn't the economics play a very you can say detrimental role at least pre covid right i mean most of the leading retailers i mean you know and and where you have worked there were, were very apprehensive and very careful about the e-commerce journey and they never saw that as a big opportunity that it can go on to become say 30% 40% of their business and the primary reason for that was economics do you see that changing or because they saw their businesses from their point of view rather than from the consumer's point of view you know and if you start looking at the business from the consumer's point of view consumer wants this product and and the retailer's job is to make sure that the consumer gets what he wants right in material of you know i can't tell the consumer no if you're buying it physically you come to me if you're buying it you know digitally don't come to me i yeah. have this way of looking at it and i think retailers need to recognize that and, and for too long they've been thinking about it from their own perspective and any industry perspective uh, you know a product perspective rather than a consumer perspective and it's time for industry to start looking at it very differently and the the retailers who start thinking like that and doing that will will actually uh, you know succeed right absolutely so i mean the natural growth and i i saw a mckinsey report which was saying that the e-commerce might be almost two and a half to three times in next uh, 18 months right so if it actually goes to it i think it's a, a quite a growth i mean if they grow from a 35 billion to 100 billion dollar market in another 18 to 24 months that that would be magic but the delta market right do you see that going to uh, the existing marketplaces like a flipkart and amazon and uh, i mean if the indian retailers really need to do and, and capture a good chunk of that at least 50% market share of of the growing e-commerce pie what are the different things they should really do and focus on so that they don't lose out that growing pie the the physical retailers don't do anything about it uh, then the you know the currently e-commerce specialists will will do something about it right and and they'll be the the winners if the physical retailers actually do something about it like reliance is claiming to you know go uh, in their e-commerce thing so i think they'll have a lot to gain i mean i i, I wouldn't uh, you know if i uh, look at it maybe the ones that will succeed will be along with uh, the amazons of the world there will be the reliances of the world who are actually you know going from physical to digital as well right and hopefully more and more uh, retailers will do exactly the same thing right right absolutely okay okay oh uh, and the very connected piece on that right is around uh, how do you view the overall market of india right i mean there is one tier one i mean which is the top 10 12 15 cities and then there is a real bharat right so which one of these uh, of these do you see bouncing back and kind of adopting the new way 
their new normal faster and and what are the different things that businesses should do to kind of really tap into uh, the untapped opportunity in bharat which which really is still not online still not kind of engaging on on a great chunk of new businesses i actually see it a very different way i mean i think this was the way it was till a few years ago uh there was this concept of india one and india two and bharat and india and a more urban yeah. version of india and a version of india that was modeled on what is happening in tier one and tier two cities i see that breaking completely i, I you know there was this big digital divide i frankly don't see the digital divide anymore i think if you look at any uh, you know any any uh, uh say news websites or any any website that content uh, portals consumption of uh, you know consumption of content is as much in, in tier 2 markets as in metros and so on so i think that entire divide that used to be there between tier 1 tier 2 and india and india 1 india 2 and so on i think over the last few years with the entire data explosion availability of high speed mobile internet the masses and uh, this bridging of that digital divide that happened the last few to 3 years i think that's that's really changing this entire concept of bharat and india Mm-hmm. this differentiation is becoming less and less relevant if you ask me i think uh, uh, it's now more a presentation to investors kind of a terminology rather than something that's really present on the ground so you have a conversation with somebody in indore on calicut or you know coimbatore or madurai and you have a conversation with uh, somebody in uh, in bombay or delhi the conversations are not very different i mean the things that they are watching and the things that they are viewing and the things that they are buying are pretty similar to what people are doing in the metros as well right so the needs aspirations and the behavior is also merging because exposure reach and the easy availability of technology has made made all of this happen look at the way the auto ott platforms are doing it i mean there is as much of a diff- demand for their content in in uh, tier 1 tier 2 as as it is in metro so in that sense that digital uh, divide that used to make sure that there is a difference you know everything has got democratized now mm. i don't think you really need different strategies anymore for bharat and india you need to treat them like you would in traditional marketing you know they're just plain simple segments either demographically or geographically or psychographically mapped out and they could be uh, for example you and me i could be working out of madurai now you know i tomorrow i mean there are uh, colleagues of mine who are now working out of meerut lucknow ahmedabad baroda and hyderabad all of them who were earlier you know sitting in cp in delhi yeah i don't know the difference whether they are working from meerut or from hyderabad right it's a, it's it's really the same so that's going to change quite dramatically i think and and both bharat and india will will probably go through this entire change simultaneously is my prediction mm, absolutely absolutely uh but another connected piece on that is i mean if you, if you talk about uh say globally accepted retail formats like a 7 711 right it does exist in all the leading parts of the world fairly good makes makes a good amount of of money profitable why do models like that not really exist in india and if at all they do in a delhi in form of 247 why don't they exist in the in the real bharat and the other other, other cities in segment of india do you see that changing or do you think it will never happen the need A consumer need that 7-Eleven is fulfilling was already fulfilled by a Kirana store in India. Yeah, so, uh, you are not really replacing what a Kirana guy was doing, right? And that's that's really the difference. You made a fancier looking store, right? Uh, but uh, you weren't really uh, giving him more than what he already got. You were giving the consumer more than what he what he already got, and. Uh, and that's really the reason there are already enough retailers serving the convenience format in in the city whether you want a cigarette or you want uh, you know uh, knickknacks snacks whatever it is there are enough retailers in the country uh, serving that need within arms length of desire uh, anywhere in everywhere in this country and as long as that is true uh, why would a 711 need to be there and 711 mm-hmm. will compete with a neighborhood kirana store or the you know neighborhood uh, pan cigarette uh, kiosk sure so it's it's always difficult he's got a low rent and you've got a high rent and, and therefore you'll you'll always be less profitable so that that's really where the model is going but all of your uh, kirana stores can become 711 equivalents they can mm-hmm. modernize themselves as well and, and do the same and a lot of them have done it as well absolutely yeah. i have some very interesting statistics on this to share ramesh so we did some analysis to understand the retail density of say us versus china versus india okay and and to our surprise what we understood in us 
there is one retail store for every 7500 people in china that number is somewhere around 45 4600 in india that number is 250 so there is one retail store for every 250 people do you think this is the Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I mean, this is like super competitive, right? I mean, you are almost having retail density of twenty x of of a US and and a China. So how how would a modern retailer, a large format retailer, a, a discounter, how how do you really cope up to that, right? This is very very intense competition. The way a retailer manages in the US manages in the US is by increasing the consumer price. Hmm. India, it's capped. You can't do that. Because yeah. There is no concept of Seven Eleven that can actually work. You know, in, in America, you drive out for a cheaper deal, and you mm. for convenience you pay higher. You can't do that in India, and that's that's really the fundamental flaw in the. I don't know whether it's flaw, it's a flaw, or it, 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 it's it's a better thing to have, but that essentially brings the profitability of convenience retail down, right? And and you're not you know ask you're not letting the consumer pay for convenience, mm. convenience free. So he's getting, you know, everything at arm's length at the same price that he would go get if he's, you know, going somewhere else and getting. And that's that's the fundamental, you know, uh, structural difference between India and 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 the West. And therefore, as long as MRPs are there, it'll always be difficult for you know uh, a guy to charge a higher price for a bottle of water uh, than it would be available at a uh, uh, supermarket or a supermarket. Uh, absolutely but this does affect the profitability of the large format retailers as well right because the consumer is getting a good chunk of their basket from the nearby store and is going only once to a, to a large format store so both both formats are therefore you know less profitable that the, than they can be right yeah. consumer who is willing to pay more for convenience is not getting that mm-hmm. is not paying that and the retailer who is at a distance is also not getting the benefit because he is not getting the benefit of you know uh you know dramatically lower prices and therefore incremental demand right absolutely um let's maybe take a few questions on the chat are you able to see them or should i just read them out to you so i mean the first question there is from varun uh he is trying to ask uh, uh, what about the brick and mortar uh, behemoths who have been unsuccessful uh at the e-commerce transition w- what should they do he is particularly asking about future growth they've been trying it since 2008 i mean you can decide as to answer that or not but what's your take on that I don't know about future group, but you know every everyone needs to really look at uh, you know merging the boundaries between e-commerce and uh, and and e-com uh, future group too was working on exactly that for the last uh, year or two, right? Uh, you every store of yours has to behave like a restaurant does today. I mean, there is dine-in, there is takeaway, there is home delivery. Mm. Your store in the neighborhood needs to have you know a shop inside. Uh, pick it at its store or home delivery i mean everyone you know it can't depend on, on depend on your model or your version of the truth or your version of you know what you you should be look at it from a consumer's perspective and the answer is where it should be very clear for anybody who's looking at it from from a consumer's perspective that the consumer is shopping in different ways the same consumer is shopping in three different ways and therefore uh, you need to to exactly do that as well right absolutely but are you saying i mean where are they going wrong is it the cultural transformation of the organization to welcome e-commerce or is there some something else that that's missing i think there's too much of inertia there's too much of old learning there's too much of baggage uh, unless you drop the baggage unless you drop your past learnings unless you you know look at opportunity and see opportunity for what it is you'll never be able to change you're so full of past glory and so full of what you've done in the past that you're not seeing what's happening in the present and what could be in the future and that's really a big challenge because you know cultural transformation uh it needs to start at the top but needs to go right down right and if people don't if people in the organization are not uh, you know raising their voices to ensure that cultural transformation happens or you know making sure it, it happens it's not going to change and uh, it's it's for leaders to make sure that you know they're they're making that change happen right right absolutely you know you'll find yourself moving too slow for the for your survival true true uh, and another question on that on the chat is uh, what is the kind of uh, omni channel adoption that you see uh, for retailers today say what percentage of their business today is really omni channel again omni channel is a is a complicated word but i mean let's just call it say online ordering of of any platform whatsoever and and where do you think they should get to if they really want to sustain 
uh, from a long term perspective i think it should be 100% omni channel if you ask me there is one consumer hmm. there are multiple ways of buying and that one consumer's data should be how many physical retailers have data today zero i mean yeah 10% of our physical retailers have any data and yeah. they are in some loyalty program or some some something like that right nobody knows this consumer nobody knows what consumers are doing nobody knows who is doing what but every e-commerce retailer knows who is doing what if you don't have the data for your consumer and don't you know make that single uh, consumer id the, the 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 reason to be of your organization then uh, you'll struggle and no matter what you try you'll never be able to create that omni channel you know get the omni channel benefits because consumers are there are two the same consumer is is shopping in two different names one when he's physically in your store and the other is when he's shopping online with you and you're not getting the benefits of the information so omni channel will happen when you know retailers culturally uh, you know sort of uh, make that change happen uh, realize that this is a reality and make sure that when consumers come into show, stores you you're capturing their data to ensure that you give them exactly what they want whenever they want wherever they want right right, right. i I, th- i think the overall education around data and the impact it can create in india is much lesser than all the other country that we that, that we look up to right and another very interesting question on the chat i see on that line is do you see kirana's kind of transforming themselves and becoming bigger like would they start stocking say more skus and kind of start competing with the uh, modern retailers do you see that happening and would that be a potential threat for the modern retailers right now well, the reality of situation is most good kirana stores in the country have higher sku count than modern retailers and <laughs> the, you know well kept secret but the fact is that your neighborhood premium a class kirana store has a higher number of skus than in fact any startup you know and uh, you must be talking to startups all the all the time you ask a startup fmcg entrepreneur and ask him how difficult it is to get into a you know modern trade and how easy it is to get into a a class modern retailer a class uh, you know kirana store in any city in this country and that will give you the answer modern retailers are preventing new re- new skus and new startups from entering their stores and the startups don't even know how to get there because you know there is a wall there is a security guard and there is you know they are they, they don't know how to get in right and that's where the kirana store stores score and if kirana stores can actually become uh, a little more digitized a little more digital a little more you know uh, tech savvy they'll actually beat uh, modern trade hollow so called modern trade you know the large formats supermarkets right right yeah. so you think it's only a threat they have to figure it out anyway if you really want range and assortment go to your neighborhood you know uh, kirana store which is now probably a, a small format supermarket right mm-hmm. you have more skus than any large format retail right right in need of any capacity he'll tell you that it's easier to launch in these stores than it is to you know all launch in these stores or online Than yeah. to launch in, uh, in modern trade, and that's a shame. I mean, that's a big opportunity that you know modern trade stores are missing. Yeah, true. I think that's that's a massive opportunity lost indeed. Okay, uh, there's another very interesting question, which is around uh, what what Reliance is really up to. Would love to get your thoughts. Okay, I mean, whatever they're doing is super aspirational. I am sure all of us have great respects for for them. But do you think this is a step towards towards monopoly? Would Reliance go on to become a monopoly, and is this a a step towards retail consolidation i don't know retailers never got consolidated anywhere in the world i mean there are yeah. retailers everywhere uh, and retail is something that comes naturally to you know uh, most societies and therefore i i doubt anybody will become a monopoly unless you you know take out parts of the market and say this is a monopoly but as far as serving the consumer is concerned will anybody have a monopoly i doubt it but uh, the good thing about the way man goes about whatever they're doing is really that you know they they throw money and technology uh, on a, onto a problem and uh, sooner or later they have a solution right they may fail once fail twice uh, but as long as you're continuing to put money and technology behind the problem you will find a solution and that's what they've done in telecom you know i remember when we were working at we always said that you know they don't know how to do consumer businesses and therefore will struggle with consumer businesses today they have a 30 35 percent market share and that happens and then so uh, they proved that uh, you know throw 
throw enough money investments and it's not a bad thing throw money investments technology uh, behind a good idea and you can in 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 the medium term be fabulously successful and i think there's the same thing that they will do in retail and therefore they will again succeed in retail for the simple reason that you know they are in it for the long term and not in it for you know the the, the short term and they don't you know pull back because of a a short term uh issue that they have or technology going wrong or any of that sort they go back and again invest you know and if they've decided they're going after it they go after it whether it's a ngo business or a you know b2b business right absolutely and the final uh, bit on on the reliance piece is again on the chat is do you see reliance doing uh, to retain what they did to telecom i just said that actually <laughs> <laughs> because nobody else is you know, nobody else is doing anything no so they in telecom at least they had a they had tough competition yeah in retail there is no competition because nobody is doing enough true so absolutely interesting uh, a few more on those from the audience again is do you think the ambience of a store impacts the purchase intent of a customer and are consumers more likely to buy in a modern retail format with has a good music and audio i'm sure uh, i'm i'm sure that you know people are looking for that audience uh, that uh, that ambience and uh, there is enough research to suggest that you know uh, better the audio on store uh, the higher the purchase okay or, okay uh, the consumers probably stays longer and therefore you know browses longer and in any modern trade situation if you stay longer and browse longer you yeah. sort of buy more so uh, everything that you can do to make sure that you know the the consumer stays longer mm. uh, would be great and uh, it's something that would uh, make sure that the store is successful right absolutely uh, another one i think from sharad you must know uh, sharad from hypercity days very well uh, is around uh, uh, what do you think the uh, retailers can do in i mean particularly fashion retailers right because of covid trial of clothes is is a big problem so how do you think retailers can overcome that you <laughs> are the best people to answer that you know uh, i'm sure they'll find some innovative solution and you know i just uh, flew to goa and came back and airlines have found innovative ways of making sure that everything is uh, you know yeah. uh, perfect in flight so i don't see any reason why retailers should not do the same I was staying in hotels. You no, know, I because I was quarantined for a couple of days. I stayed in a hotel as well, and the hotels okay. done everything they can to make sure that you know uh, it is safe and uh, it's, it's perfectly in tune with what a post-COVID scenario would be. So uh, I think uh, retailers will find some, find some way of doing. Right. I think you just said uh, that there is no real competition, and I see a question box popping up in in retail. I see a question popping up about DMART. How do you see the DMART versus uh, Reliance? You can say economics and 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 the scale. Right? Both of them are phenomenally large, growing at some unprecedented scale. I yeah. mean, yeah. DMART is competition, of course. I mean, DMART is doing very well, but I think they can scale up faster. Uh, maybe they have they have slowed down a bit in terms of the 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 scale that they could they could all they are still stuck on the physical part of it. I don't know how successful they are. uh digital uh, trials have been but i think uh, they have the money and the wherewithal to invest in invest in the future i don't know whether they are doing significant investments in technology i don't know whether they're doing whether they're doing significant investments in anything more than physical retail right yes they have made about mm-hmm. all of it but uh, whether they're actually uh, doing enough on the technology side i don't know there is opportunity for them as well because you know there's just one guy who's doing most of the No, uh, that's what, yeah. Of course, they've you know. There's no doubt about the fact that they've done very well. Hmm. Absolutely, I think Bmart is just one very different example. Again, I have some stats to share here. Uh, they actually have gone uh, online uh, in most of their stores, and we were checking some statistics of the Bmart online website as well as the app. The UI, UX, etc., looks horrible to be honest. Uh, but the numbers are still phenomenal. They are growing uh, month on month. and they are at a scale where they're talking about like 70 80000 daily active users which actually translate to 10 12000 grocery orders trust me there's nobody else who does that swiggy does less than that donzo does 
so that were purely you can say highly distributed and and large from format hyper local players so how how does dmart really win this game right they didn't do it the right way but still like numbers always speak for them that's data is that data true that's brilliant i mean i mean they're a very secretive organization there's very little data that you have about dmart out in the open and and that's really where the problem is and they consciously maintain that secrecy as well and that that's a good thing uh but uh, if they're doing that and if they get that kind of you know they've started getting that kind of uh, result from uh, the e-commerce portion then that, i think that's great i've been in delhi for the last for the last year I haven't seen any demands around uh but uh, you know my data is dated probably a year year and a half old so uh if they're doing well that's great i mean i think reliance needs some competition and i think uh, if demart can give it because they've got you know enough investments as well in, in the company with adequately you know uh, public in, in terms of shareholding and Okay. Right, but compare that for us, right? When when a Reliance, when a Future Group, or or any of the other, say Walmart, etc., right? They go for e-commerce. Number one is like build a very beautiful platform, focus on customer experience, make sure the delivery timing is awesome, do like crazy amount of marketing. How does Demart just not do any of that and still end up delivering good numbers? I think they understood their customer very well. I mean, they're they're focused on a particular set of customers who trade off uh, the convenient the the. Uh, stuff around ambience and so on for price and if they've they've found the sweet sweet spot in terms of the trade off and who the consumer is we need to make the trade off you know uh, it's a it's a great uh, it's great marketing great uh, you know business strategy and it will work for them for that consumer base right it won't get me into demart but mm. they don't need me in demart because they've got yeah. enough you know at the at the bottom of the middle of the pyramid who are uh, looking at the value that uh, demart offers to them and and that's very 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 good for them you know i give this old example of hyco versus uh, dmart in powai right mm. so hyco and dmart are situated opposite each other right mm. and put a camera on the two and there are two separate sets of consumers who go into hyco and uh, into dmart and both are fabulously successful you know hyco is mm. probably you know uh, one of the best retailers in bombay yeah right? and uh, dmart is as well but uh, both of them successful in the same location opposite each other and two separate sets of consumers and that's that's really the beauty of retail and, and if you understood the consumer and you've got that sweet spot great for you make sure that you're in in getting technology in as well so that you know you can serve the customer wherever whenever you know whatever they need so that's that's the only unsolicited advice i would have for both of them right right Okay, another uh, connected piece in, on that is around supply chain, right? I mean, a lot of supply chain disruption happened, like getting goods into the stores and then eventually delivering it to the customer. If at all you are having the e-commerce route was disrupted, I think it's it's quite back uh, to some level, but I think still there is a big gap. Do you see uh, like the break in supply chain affecting the profitability and and the core things uh, for for a retailer? I I don't know that that should come back faster than anything else. you know I, yeah. i don't know whether supply is going to be a problem because fmcg companies or largely the grocery guys at least uh, if you're talking about grocery retail uh, stocks have started coming back into store yeah yeah i think that supply chain would be a, you know wouldn't be a problem but i think there is a fundamental other supply chain issue which is the investment in technology and supply chain right which is where most physical retailers today are falling short they haven't done enough probably you know the the No, I, I, this is the whole thing about competing with an Amazon, which is a technology company versus retailers who are physical, regular retail companies, right? Redefining your business as you know, technology being a critical pillar of your business is is absolutely essential, and I don't think retailers have yet done that, right? Can uh, technology be as important to physical retailers of today as it is to Amazon or to Flipkart or to you know? any large uh, e-commerce retailer is is really the question and how do you make that it's not just about you know it's people processes and let's call it in in the new era it's called product right product yeah. is not the product but you know product management in a, in a technology framework so people process and product right are we adequately focused on all three people and pro- people yes there is a lot of focus processes very average focus and uh, you know product which is the technology element of it very little focus how do you bring process and product up and that's when supply chain will start getting efficiencies to the retail business 
Right now, supply chain is the most inefficient as far as most retail businesses are concerned in this country. Yeah. You look at the Amazons of the world, and the, you look at the Amazons of the world. They build their organizations on on supply chain. They are retailers. They are they are technology companies first, and retailers second. Yeah. True, true, and like the automation they have driven in supply chain is is, is massive, and that's how they're able to make yeah, the money. You deliver cheaper, and all of these issues of you know supply chain being costly will not be a situation for them in the future. And I'm sure you know there would be people investing in it, but a lot of Indian physical retailers or the large retailers, not entry retailers, not investing enough in supply chain. Right, absolutely. another one uh, from the chat on that is and this has been my question as well i've been trying to get as much knowledge on this as possible kirana still form like a 90% of the overall of of, of of the overall retail in india do you see a oyo for kirana or sorts of sorts happening i think a lot of people have tried but there hasn't been considerable headways do you think that should happen will that ever happen for what's the take i don't know whether the oyo for kirana is the right uh, analogy oyo is also yeah the organizations which claim to be technology organizations are actually physical organizations they you know True. Uh, they are only theoretically technology organizations they are not mm-hmm. oyo is wrong. They're probably the wrong example i i don't think you know uh, that's the right example but yes there is an opportunity for a, a 711 kind of thing you know franchise mm-hmm. of where, you know your your somebody comes along and sort of brands all the neighborhood retailers under one banner and, and brings it You know, under one common supply chain, it's possible. I think Tom could be the one. It could be Metro. It could be any of these cash and carry guys. Probably should try doing that because it makes maximum sense. So if they Correct. don't focus on the back end, they're also focused on the front end and you know getting a uniform branding in the front end through franchising or you know bringing people under one roof and make sure supply chain works for for all of these people. That would be great. I mean, FMCG companies would have to spend much less. trying to deliver to uh, to retailers then absolutely but uh, that is also connected to the overall loyalty right so what is your take on loyalty is the consumer in india real loyal do loyalty programs and loyalty cards really work is there any way to really inspire that sense of loyalty in the customer the uh, you know arbitrage between uh, convenience and effort so you know you will i mean we always talked about this as you know consumers going to small format stores or neighborhood retail you know maybe once or twice a week or to the vegetable vendor once or twice a week and then going once a week to a you know a, a hypermarket further down right you made that effort once a week but the mm-hmm. balance of the week uh, top up shopping was done in the in the in the neighborhood there will be some combinations with the kind of traffic that is there hopefully post covid traffic will come down and then modern trade retailers will find people coming from longer and longer distances you know that that distance from which people used to come to your store has come down dramatically you know in the yeah. good old days in hyper city uh, people would come in from bandra to anar to shop mm-hmm. in city. then yeah. it became juhu to sorry or andheri or juhu to malad Th- then it became sort of lokanwala to uh, malad then it became malad to malad and slowly the hypermarket itself started becoming a neighborhood hypermarket rather than you know hypermarket that was the way it was intended in the beginning that you know people will come out from you know from whatever suburbs there are to shop in a sub hypermarket so traffic did that you know yeah. uh, complexity of travel did that you know the the, the sheer pain of traveling did that so hopefully post covid traffic has come down quite dramatically uh yeah. is back on the roads but you know traffic is much less than before a lot of people are still at home uh so if if that continues that maybe people will actually go to a supermarket that's or a hypermarket that's further down for a better deal or a better experience or better you know more convenient more uh, value for money or whatever it is that motivates them So that's that's really the change that I think would be there. Right, absolutely. I, I think there are a few more questions. I'll pause this for a for a while. Uh, maybe digress into another uh, a theme of, of today's discussion. Right, that that's around uh, Atman Nirbhar Bharat. Right, what, what does it mean for you? Like, what is your in like you can say uh, output of that? When I mean, a lot of people must be asking you this, right? So, what are the changes that you are going to do? What are the principal advice you are going to give? Basis that does it really have a uh, uh, have a change in in the way you look at things? No, I I think Atmanirbharta is about confidence. It's not about closing yourself out to the world and getting more nationalistic and getting more insular. I think that's the exact opposite of what we need to do, right? Mm. We've already been through this through the 70s and 80s. We were all this, you know, 
all this atmanirbhar tha and you know uh, nationalism was uh, was high and we wanted to do everything ourselves and you know make in india and all of that stuff it didn't work when it started working was when you know in the 90s when we liberalized and you know brought in uh, investments and brought in people to invest in this country and that's when you know things changed for the consumer things changed for the ordinary indian right so this time it has to be less you know the little definition is about nationalism and it's about you know self lines and make in india and so on i think it's has to be much more about you know uh, self confidence it's about making sure that the people of india are confident enough to you know make things and people are confident enough to buy things made in india because they made well and they have great quality and you know, we make you know most of what we need so i think you know it's 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 more about having pride but with humility it's about you know making sure there's confidence without any arrogance mm-hmm. uh, that's what will really truly make us atmanirbhar you no know, and and the missing piece in this atmanirbhata is education skilling you know uh, what it needs to create an entrepreneurial environment in this country you can keep saying atmanirbhata but you know there is there isn't enough entrepreneurial spirit left or enough encouragement for that entrepreneurial spirit to make that happen so you know getting rid of the regulation getting rid of you know a lot of the uh, the uh, you know the the policy framework that governs us today is critical for really getting atmanirbhar ta going otherwise it will be an empty slogan and it will take all of us down yeah. right and the consumption will drop uh, we will not have enough variety to consume you will be consuming what you will go back to the days of you either choose a blue maruti or a gray maruti or a red maruti So that's all the choice you had, right? And you had to stand in queue for a gas connection, and you had to stand in queue for a you know television connection, and you had one television with you know X number of fixed programs, and that's that's really what Atmanirbharta meant at one point of time. And we have to change from that complete definition and really make sure that we are you know talking about a more confident India, a more self-reliant India, because we make stuff for the world, not because you know we make only the stuff that we can make. Mm. that's what china did and you know you can learn from what china did in the last 20 years you know they may be enemy now but you know uh, there's no harm in learning from the enemy and, and copying some of the stuff so try right. to them is killing your manpower you know? mm. so that people are skilled enough to make the stuff that you are currently importing from elsewhere right right absolutely i have one quick question on on the copying piece that that you told right i'm sure you must have seen the memes as well as the a uh, geo meet launch yesterday right it's a exact replica of zoom so what's what's your take on that do you think this is normal behavior and you should obviously learn from and the iteration zoom has done to arrive at this are phenomenal no doubt but do you think it's good it's it's healthy yeah as long as uh, you know the quality is good you know so uh, you know somebody is talking about uh, hingari or something like that the app yeah that, yeah this uh, tiktok uh, yeah but it depends on you know you read the the comment section of of the app and you realize what the product is so somebody has to really go beyond just making a jugad product jugad is a word that needs to be thrown out of our lexicon if we want yeah. to have another word right mm. jugad and atmanirbharta does not go together at all mm. yeah absolutely absolutely if the world is not willing to buy from you then you are not doing anything really about you know atmanirbharta True, true. That also brings a question on the uh, on the overall quality of Indian tech, Indian startups, and, and so on, right? Why do we have to back up? I mean, I'm personally happy about all the ban of the 59 apps and so on, but uh, why do we have to ban a TikTok to make a Indian uh, equivalent skyrocket? So, what What do you think is missing? What you need is self confidence is missing. Nothing else, you know, and and adequate skilled manpower. So we have a lot of skilled manpower software engineers. Yeah. One level below that, we don't have anybody. The hmm. the Twitters and the you know the people uh, who who actually do the stuff you know whether it is making mobile phones or making equipment or making anything that you know runs this world right that level is missing so we've managed to conquer the world as software engineers and you know you know doing software engineering and you know creating software for the world but uh, products for the world require skills that skilling mm-hmm. for creating products is not present right we have created a lot of software engineers. we haven't created enough skilled machinists mechanics you know people uh, who normally would say come out of the itis of the world right right some training 
and stuff like that, which is what is required to create a large industrial base or large you know, production base, which then can replace whatever is there in the country. Right, right. They have scaled up manufacturing to a level mm -hmm. that nobody can compete. And how do we create enough people to man those manufacturing hubs in India? If at all we create them. Right, right, absolutely. Uh, maybe moving into another uh, direction altogether. I mean, you have been a CEO and, and have held leadership roles at so many different companies in different industries. What is leadership for you? How do you kind of define it? How do you inculcate it in your approach, in your team? How do you differentiate between young leaders versus experienced leaders? When do you prefer whom? And some more insights on that. Uh, to me, leadership is about really inspiring people. Inspiring people to go beyond the call of duty. If you can actually inspire people to go beyond the call of their duty and what their JD says, then you're a good leader. Mm. A good leader is probably one who can sort of get the brain cells of his team active. You know, mm. and people are living that in their workplace. You know, and if you can get their uh, brain cells working again, you know, their hormones flowing and their muscles moving, then you're a good leader. You need to move them out of their inertia. You know, the, a good leader is a force that moves the body at rest by yeah. sheer energy, passion, and probably his ability to walk the talk and, and inspire. That's, that to me is leadership. Got it. And how do you differentiate between young and, or, and experienced leaders? When do you prefer whom? Ah, uh, for a lot of the ages here. You know, for a long time, I only worked with older people. And, I, mean, I was the youngest in the team and you were the leader, but Everybody was older than you. And this is typically true in most FMCG companies. When you join as management trainee, you are working with people who are, you know, 10 years, 15 years elder to you. And so for 10, 15 years, I worked in that kind of an environment. So, and then suddenly 10 years ago, it all changed, right? You know, I, I moved to two new industries, telecom and retail. And there it was the exact opposite. You were the old guy there. And, you know, I was also doing it, of course. And you were the old guys guy there. And, you know, the entire crowd in, in telecom and retail was much, much younger. No, mm -hmm. since that, you know, change to telecom and retail, I've had the opportunity to work with, learn from more than anything else. And uh, I mean, probably in their opinion, mentor, but I was actually secretly learning much more from them than, than giving them, but they, they believe that I was mentoring them. Uh, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to work with younger people. Uh, and now this is the peak in that, you know, working with youngsters right now. So my, the average age of my team would probably be 27, 28. Wow. Uh, no. uh, they are, you know, <laughs> close to the age of my uh, kids. So that, that's, that's really where it is right now. And I'm enjoying it. You know, it's, it's fascinating to be with younger people. Uh, the way they think is very, very different. Uh, firstly, uh, there is no baggage. They are more honest. They say it as it is. You know, they're not scared to say anything. They say it on your face. So it's easier to deal with them because you know exactly what, what's happening. You know what's not happening. You know what uh, they feel. And you have it straight, given out without any filters. So that's, that's really the advantage of, you know, and, and if they remain like that, it will be great for an organization. But, you know, slowly they also, you know, become uh, part, of the, part of the whole, whole company. So the advantage is they're you know, not just eager to learn, they're also self-learners. And I think you know, my, my son keeps saying this, that he's an autodidact, right? Mm -hmm. He likes to learn himself. If a professor is teaching him, then you know, he doesn't learn anything. So yeah. I guess a lot of youngsters, a lot of millennials I find are exactly like that. And uh, for me, it's a pleasure to be with them for a simple reason that I, you know, I learned such a lot. If I'm mm -hmm. considered a you know, uh, somebody who's doing digital today, not a digital expert, but, you know, somebody who's capable of creating digital companies today. Mm. It's not because I learned anything on my own. It's all sort of absorbed and, uh, uh, you know, out of listening to them and learning from them. That's, that's the way uh, I would look at it. Right, right. So one more question on that. Not sure if you remember, almost what, uh, two and a half years back, you had visited our office in, in Domlur. And uh, I think you were probably 52 then. Uh, and I, I just took a, I mean, you're talking uh, and obviously the team was watching us. 
<laughs> yeah, so that's exactly the question, right? I, I, I mean, you and I were talking, and later I asked my team to guess your age, and and they were like probably thirty five, thirty eight, thirty nine was the uh, average. I mean, a guess that that I got. So how how do you keep yourself so young, so fit? I mean, so so different. No, no, it's nothing to do with me. It's to do genetic coding. <laughs> nothing. No other reason. I think I just keep myself active and make sure that you know I'm learning from. <laughs> the best young people in the in the country and that keeps you young and you're always on your toes because you're working with them so there is no bureaucracy around there is no nothing to there's nothing to age you around you as long as there's nothing to age you around you i think you are you will remain fit and and right also you try to get into environments that don't age me that's that's what <laughs> thank you interesting very interesting i'll quickly move on to a very quick rapid fire uh, ramesh i mean i tried doing it earlier but i think in the series of questions could not ask what what's your favorite movie no favorite movie actually uh, nowadays i'm on this uh, trip of uh, watching malayalam movies oh really okay okay any good ones you came across recently never great i never grew up in kerala but you know as you age <laughs> mentally you uh, genetic streak in you which takes you back to your uh, roots and right the strip of watching malayalam movies i'm really enjoying so i would urge you all of them come with subtitles nowadays i think there's a lot of <laughs> malayalam movies that would be as good as any english or korean movie you've watched wow fantastic sure i'll, I'll give it a try interesting uh, what who, who or she is i mean uh, is your favorite actor actress actor i love ensemble cast i mean there is no actor okay. who i don't like a you know a uh, main actor main uh, you know somebody who is the hero hero in kind of a movie wherever there is an ensemble cast and that's how i love malayalam movies because you no know, it's always an ensemble cast it's not it's not focused on any one man you know it's 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 a story that the hero is the director who's a hero and that's that's really good right uh, you have lived in lot of cities which is your favorite city in india i started like in delhi oh really wow that that's quite a change people agree with me but you know i have started working i lived in bombay for a long time uh, this is my second stint in delhi but i really love uh, the place it's much cleaner neater you feel like you're in a city you don't feel like you're in a, you know uh, a war zone like you would in bombay because everything is crumbling around you yeah construction <clears throat> interesting uh, your favorite holiday destination india or abroad Home is my holiday. I mean, uh, home is Goa, so I don't need a holiday destination. Yeah, actually, that's a, that's a good part. Interesting, nice, nice. What do you think is your big biggest achievement in life? Something that you are very happy or proud about? Nothing really. I mean, it's that's still, modesty at its at at its some next level, Ramesh. I'm still climbing up that hill. You know, I'm and uh, maybe I'm searching for the wrong thing, but you know, yeah. I I don't think you know there is any big achievement that I would really be proud of, but yeah. I, I still work in progress. Maybe if I uh, create a startup like yours, then I would be very proud. That that just mo- modesty, guys. Please don't take that seriously. Uh, uh, who who are the super successful people uh, you follow? Your your inspiration. I mean, how do you keep yourself going? Uh, people who inspire me. I think uh, anybody who's creating being creative and creating new things. I think uh, Musk uh, is is really doing something. Bill Gates has done something. No, uh, Steve Jobs has done great stuff. Uh, I think any of these guys who are really, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not being, you know, saying these are the only guys, but you know, there are lots of them in India who are doing the same as well. And anybody who does inspirational stuff, I mean, uh, I think who are uh, going out of their shell to sort of break out and do new stuff, I think is inspiring. Their stories are inspiring. Mm, right, right. Interesting. Uh, what are the few areas? I mean, you are working very closely with startups. You have been advising us for a very long time. If you have to invest, what are the industries or sectors you would put your money in? I think there's a huge opportunity. You know, over the next few years, and, and that's the whole uh, you know uh, magic that's going to or waiting to happen. Yeah. I think India needs, to, in order to be atmanirbhar, you need a million startups to come. Wow. Yeah. If you don't, I mean, China already has that. I mean, if you're really seriously thinking of competing with China, then you need to let those million startups boom, and and it's across industries, manufacturing. You know, manufacturing startups 
if you want to really be self reliant you need to have at least a, a million of them mm -hmm. and, right right so uh, i think there's a huge opportunity there uh, it's not so much in the small stuff that that uh, we need to invest now it's really in the really big stuff which is actual creation of products manufacturing uh, if you can have startups in that space which use technology technology adequately and create products for the future or products that will make us self reliant that would be great i mean and that, that's the huge opportunity that i see anybody is going to go into any of these categories i think will will get investment and will do well wow okay interesting and uh, another one is around uh, around excel when you were at excel ri uh, i mean long time back and when you kind of compare your life versus your expectations then how how have you done what are the things that you would go back and change if at all any i don't i don't think so yeah i mean I, this is the career that i dreamt out before going to excel and this is what happened after excel and it's more or less panned out exactly the way i dreamt it would sometimes it's gone slow sometimes it's gone faster but uh, you know i think i'm lucky and blessed that you know it's gone more or less the way that i planned it to go wow wow that that's incredibly amazing your three key learnings of life Think your learnings of life. I have three principles: observe, listen, absorb. You know, I keep <laughs> repeating this mantra, Ola mantra. Yeah, yes. yeah. As much as you can, observe, listen, and absorb, because you never know when you need it. And and if you can absorb, you can be a sponge or a fly on the wall in in, in conversations. I mm -hmm. think you never know when when all of that learning and all of that you know that you've absorbed comes to use, and and that's typically been of use to me as I. you know shifted between industries you know i didn't right. know anything about the industries i moved to and i moved to media year back i knew nothing about media and i never you know even associated with myself with anybody in the media industry but you know just sitting and observing listening and absorbing has helped me uh, learn as much as i can in the short period that i have been here right so i guess if you are honest and open minded and ever ready for new experiences and new learnings you'll be fine wow wow that that's amazing i think we're short of time time we are about to uh, wrap up here i'll quickly take a few questions in the chat i think people want to know a lot more uh, from you so there's a question up there which is can you name your favorite boss and why i don't know i hope you're not listening i don't <laughs> <laughs> i'll be forced to say that it's my current boss but any boss gives you freedom to you know sort of do what you want to do gives you the space gives you the autonomy and gives invest in you and invest in you i don't mean trading programs and so on invest in you as in you know invest in your in your work is a mm -hmm. great boss. uh all i need all i ask of my boss is some space and i think you no know, uh, uh, some of my bosses have really given that space and i i'm happy that i'm working with them fantastic and i think a final one maybe which is your favorite sport are you playing anything these days you like something particularly I'm not playing anything. I watch all kinds of sports. I watch cricket. I watch. Uh, I used to watch Formula One. I used to watch soccer, football. Uh, I can watch any sport. So okay. No particular favorite. Cricket is still my favorite, but you know I don't spend time watching cricket as much as you know I used to because it's, it's too long drawn now, and there's not enough time to watch cricket as much as you would. I've had earlier, so right. Anything shorter? Since you said cricket, so I'm like forced to ask one more. Uh, Virat versus Sachin, and why? Actually, neither. Yeah. You know, I'm a MS Dhoni kind of guy. You okay, know, okay. You know, not these uh, flashy, great, you know, stars. I I prefer be you know sober, humble, down to earth, you know, cerebral uh, person. And I didn't. I don't think the other two are. Uh, yeah. Have the qualities that I described. Absolutely, absolutely. MS Dhoni. Fantastic, fantastic. I think that brings me to an end. Ramesh, is there anything else you would want to add uh, about today's session or anything in general? I hope you do well, and I hope you take the opportunity, you know, that this uh, entire pandemic, you know, pandemic has thrown up uh, at us. I think it's a never before, never again kind of a scenario for all of us, and let's all learn as much as we can and uh, transform. our organizations transform ourselves and make sure the world is a better place
Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Ramesh. I think I, this is what always happens. We start conversing and one hour just gets over. You don't even realize. So I think this has been another very interesting session and I'm very confident I've had at least some 15 more like this with you one on one on before. So it's absolutely amazing talking to you. Thanks a lot for taking time. It's a pleasure to uh, host you here. Thanks a lot for taking time. Let's stay in touch uh, like always. Thank you. Great thanks, day. thanks everyone for joining. Uh, this would also be available on our Facebook page and our Twitter handle. The, the live video of this, you can share and kind of give it to your friends and relatives if at all you want. Do watch out for the next episode. We are trying to get uh, some experts from the uh, direct-to-consumer brands industry. It'll actually be a different format. We are trying out a panel this time. We'll get some uh, three, four CEOs from the uh, D2C industry and watch out for that. Thanks, Ramesh. Thanks a lot for joining.